Değerli katılımcılar, sempozyumumuzun e, bu kısmında e, Cooper Surgical International'ın yani Türkiye'de Origio, daha öncesinde Medek olarak bilinen ve Türkiye'deki en önemli e, sarf malzemesi sağlayıcısı bizim alanımızdaki firmalardan birinin International e, kısmının e, önemli bir sunumu var. E, burada e, önemli bir e, ayrıntıyı bildirmek istiyorum. Sunum sırasında Konuşmacıya sorular kısmından, e, ekranın alt kısmında bulunan e, yazarsanız biz e, sevgili arkadaşım e, Başak Balaban'la birlikte yöneteceğiz bu e, bölümü. E, biz soruları e, konuşmacıya aktaracağız. E, lütfen e, aklınıza geldiği zaman yazın. Çünkü sonuçta zaten soru cevap kısmında e, biz bir e, değerlendirme yaptıktan sonra konuşmacıyı aktaracağız. Belki hepsine vakit ayıramasak bile elimizden geldiği kadar benzer soruları sormaya bir bölümde toplamaya çalışacağız. Konu çok güzel bir konu. Aslında Türkiye'de de yaygınlaşacağını beklediğimiz bir konu. Belki daha sonra konuşmanın ardından Başak Balaban da bahsetmek ister. Kendisi bildiğim kadarıyla buna benzeyen bir güvenlik sistemi kullanıyor. Ve bu konuyla ilgili olarak da ee, önümüzdeki dönemde hem e, numunelerin korunması hem de e, ileri dönemlerde laboratuvar e, işlemlerinin standartizasyon açısından böyle bir güvenlik sistemi çok önem arz ediyor. Ben e, şimdi sözü e, değerli e, arkadaşım ve e, panel başkanı e, Başak Balavan'a bırakıyorum. O İngilizce olarak e, Sevin Loydu e, sunacak. E, arkasından da e, güzel bir sunum izleyeceğiz. Keyifli izlemeler diyorum. Başak, ekran senin. Teşekkür ederim hocam. Cooper Surgical International firması tarafından düzenlenen webinara hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bu oturumu Ahmet hocamın da belirttiği gibi sevgili başkanımla birlikte yürüteceğim. Bu oturuma başlamadan önce Cooper firmasının bu online sempozyumumuza vermiş olduğu büyük destek için çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Ee, Ahmet Hocam da yine az önce kendisi de ifade etti. Ee, bu webinarda özellikle bu pandemi döneminde bu ART uygulamalarına yavaş yavaş hepimiz başlıyoruz. Ve özellikle ilk aşamalarda laboratuvarımızda çalışacak eleman sayısını e, minimize, e, minimize etme açısından e, mümkün olduğunca az kişinin çalışabilmesi için yine kritik bir önem arz etmekte bu e, elektronik şahitleme sistemleri ve RFID dediğimiz e, radyo frekans tanımlama teknolojisi ile e, çalışan sistemler ve konuşmacımız İngiltere'den Sally Lloyd. Ben öncelikle tabii ki katılımcılarımızın e, Türk olmasından dolayı yani Türkçe e, kendisiyle ilgili bilgileri Türkçe aktarmak istiyorum ilk etapta. Kendisi aslında çok uzun yıllardır yaklaşık 20 yıla aşkın 21 yıldır bu sektörün, ART e, sektörünün içerisinde çalışıyor. Ve daha öncesindeki dönemde e, Research Instruments firmasında e, bu RI Witness yani bu elektronik e, şahitleme sisteminin ilk kurulum aşamasından itibaren kendisi aktif olarak e, rol almakta. Yani e, şirkette bu e, tanımlama sistemiyle ilgili en tecrübeli isimlerden birisi. E, ve tabii e, daha sonrasında bu Cooper şirketiyle birleşmesiyle birlikte şu anda da Cooper şirketinde Uluslararası Satış ve Destek bölümünde kendisi çalışıyor. Ve e, tabii ki bu özelliğinin yanı sıra yani şirketteki pozisyonunun yanı sıra kendisi yine bu 20 yılı aşkın süredir e, IVF laboratuvarlarında çalışan embriyologların e, önemli bir takım prosedürlerde, mikroenjeksiyon, vitrifikasyon, embriyobiyopsisi gibi işlemlerde eğitiminde e, rol aldı ve e, birçok bir e, kitap e, bölümünde ve makalelerde de yine Kendisi embriyologlarla birlikte yakın e, çalıştı. Dolayısıyla aslında bir anlamda embriyolog olarak da tanımlanabilir e, Seli. E, şimdi bugün de tabii ki biz hani işin ticari kısmında değil, daha çok bu yeni teknolojinin tanıtılması ve e, uygulaması konusunda ve hani embriyologlara ne şekilde yardımcı olunabilir e, bundan bahsedecek. E, biz e, sanıyorum Türkiye'de bu sistemin ilk kullanıcısıyız. Ee, ve yaklaşık 5 yıldır kullanıyoruz ve çok rahatlıkla söyleyebilirim ki e, özellikle yoğun siklus volümüne sahip merkezlerde kalabalık e, kişilerle çalışan laboratuvarlarda e, artık olmazsa olmaz bir e, kalite kontrol e, aracı. E, 
Sally, I wanted to make the first introduction in uh, Turkish since the participants uh, are from Turkey, but I only said good things about you. Okay. Uh, I, to <laughs> I told the people that you may also be considered as an embryologist, as an experienced mm -hmm. embryologist, because you have sacrificed a lot for the training of the embryologist over the years, over 20 years. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, you as one of my uh, friends for long terms. I can say that we've aged in this field together, right? We've started uh, you're almost... You're checking my grey hairs from <laughs> lockdown. No, no, no, Our no, hairdressers no. aren't open yet. No, I, I'm not telling about the, you know, the, uh, the age, but uh, we've been friends for over 20 years, for sure. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, your lecture about uh, RI witness systems, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Bajak. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, and thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to do this. Um, I have to say it's not as much of a pleasure as in many previous years, having actually going to the, the Turkish Society meeting normally in Antalya. And apart from, I think it was in 2016, when we had that terrible storm and the beach party was cancelled, it's been beautiful weather. Now here, right now, it's about 10 degrees C and it's raining and it's set to be like this for about the next three months. So I really wish I was in Turkey, but sadly in these strange times, um, we're doing it like this, how we adapt, it's amazing. So, okay, so I'm going to present on um, the use of RFID electronic witnessing in IVF and how we believe we can be used for um, to help in this kind of COVID era. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, can everyone see that slide okay? Yes, I think so. Okay, good. Okay, then, so I'm going to start off, I'm going to talk a little bit about human error. Um, I believe in order that I can explain to you clearly how the system can help you in times of COVID-19, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we designed it, and also about how it works. And then I think you'll be able to see how it can help in, in these strange times, and what other benefits it can bring to allow. So the key points I'm going to try to get across here, although, of course, we do everything possible that we can think of in, well, in, in all life, but particularly in, in ART, we can't completely avoid human error. Now, I fully believe that RFID electronic witnessing is going to prevent identity errors in the lab, in the clinic. It, what it can do is it can provide a full traceability proof that everything was done in the lab exactly how we wanted it to be, exactly how it should have been done. And you can use that proof for yourselves just to kind of reassure yourselves that everything has done properly, or you can use it for the patients as well. Also, I want to try to explain how easy it is to use and to start using and how the fact that it's, it will shape itself to, to be exactly how you want it to work. And um, hopefully I'm going to try and explain how it's quicker that using electronic witnessing, RFID electronic witnessing, and safer in this time of COVID-19 than human witnessing, human double witnessing. And then just to remind you, this is not new technology. It's been in clinical use now for, well, since 2007, so over 13 years. Lots of clinics use it all around the world. Lots of groups are, are using it. So um, although kind of we're talking it now, talking about it today in terms that it's new technology for, for specifically for um, providing better social distancing in the lab, um, it, it isn't new. It is established. It's, it's all over the world. So I think you're probably all familiar with this, um, this image about uh, the risk. You could use it in your risk analysis. And the idea here is that we, whatever we do, whatever industry, company, society we've got, we put these layers in, in place 
in order to form the structure, the safe kind of structure of our um, of our society. So in this one, for example, they use the technical support and training. They're the layers of, that provide the structure. But the holes in this kind of layers of Swiss cheese are the potential um, risks, the things that could potentially go wrong and lead to a systematic or a human failure. So we're going to be kind of using, looking at this model a bit more. So using an analogy that I think probably many people would understand, let's talk about driving. So we learn to drive, we get our license, we do lots and lots of practice on lots of different types of roads. <clears throat> at times of high risk, then there's things, there's signs, there's a, signs in the car as well that will warn us to be careful, you know, something's happening, be careful. But despite that, accidents do happen. So what do we do? Um, we put in extra security measures, more things that we can think of, constantly trying to improve uh, our, uh, the safety of what we're doing. So we have laws, um, and I'm using laws from the UK here, but we have laws about <laughs> drink driving, about using mobile phones, about limiting the amount of hours you can spend all to, um, all to help improve the safety on our roads. We have best practices, what society has kind of worked out to be the best way of doing things. We take a break every two hours if we're on a long journey. We don't use our mobile phones for years, we use hands-free kits instead. We also have our own protocols that we have decided. In the UK, we call it a highway code. You probably have something similar in Turkey. I know they do in most countries around Europe. And these are the rules that we have to follow, our, our own protocols. And then, of course, we have technology that has helped us, that has been developed uh, along the way. We have airbags, we have seat belts, we have these fancy things that tell us if we're swerving over the line, which it tells me quite often in my car. Um, we have the automatic braking. Um, and, and this is where the, the car is actually seeing something that our, us ourselves, as our humans, we're fallible and we haven't seen it. So let's look in IVF now. We have our laws in place. In every country, we have laws in place. We have our best practices, whether they're from the HFEA or from the Turkish Society or from ESHRI. We have each lab, each clinic's protocols. They'll decide their own ways of doing things. And all of these are uh, extra layers to, um, to put in uh, for, for the best, safest performance of our clinic. We also have technology. And this is what we're going to be talking about here. So despite all of these layers that we put into place, we're not completely infallible. We are still subject to human error. And the idea about this Swiss cheese thing is that all of these holes in these different layers, eventually one of the, they'll all line up and one failure is going to slip through the net. Now, you're all familiar with, um, with all the publications of the media uh, of um, errors in IVF. I'm not gonna go on about this. There was one, the big one last year in the US, um, again, was, a, was one that slipped through the net. So what I'd like to try to show you mm -hmm. is how technology, in this instance, RFID electronic witnessing, can put many, many, many extra layers in this, in your already, your, your layers of, um, of safety that you've already got structured in your, in your clinic. So specifically looking at human error in IVF now, there have been a few studies which show that the human error rate in IVF is extremely low about 0.1%, something like that. There's a couple of papers which, uh, which have talked about this. Um, and then also people have said that um, human double witnessing, although better than just a single human witnessing, it doesn't overcome all identity errors. So a little bit of data, recent data from UZB in Brussels, now, they've been using electronic witnessing since 2011, so nine years now. So they've just given us this data. They did 7,500 cycles in 2019, and the system picked up 236 mismatches. 
So it's very low, um, about a third of what the published rate was. But these 236 mismatches are not mix-ups. They're not at all. It's just moments when they've come, basically come to the same work area with two different patients who are not matched in the database. So, and actually, it warns them before anything happens there. Now, of this 236 mix matches, though, seven of these were true prevented mix ups. Only seven of them were. So, again, extremely, extremely low numbers, but still something that could have a catastrophic effect, not only on the patients, but also on the clinic. A few years ago, the Australia group. Um, this, the Australian RTAC group put together a working group to try and um, analyze how witnessing in IVF was done, how identification of samples was done. And some of the things they came out with are, are perfectly logical. You know, the main causes of human error, people rushing, uh, high workloads, pressure to finish a task properly. I'm not going to go through them all. But these, of course, these moments of... Um, of human error, they are they could cause a tiny lapse in concentration, a misreading of names, incorrect steps, or or even a mishearing of names. And this was evident in um in a, a mix up that happened in in Rome in Italy a few years ago, uh, whereby um, someone went out to call the patient in the waiting room, and the a different patient with a very similar name misheard her own name and came forward and actually went all the way through to embryo transfer. And these are the things that when you're looking for an electronic witnessing system, you need to be aware, you need to be thinking about how this system can stop these things happening or can prevent as much as possible these things happening. So a little bit now on how the system works. So, Radio frequency identification. I won't, I'll only say it once, but it's RFID, radio frequency identification. So we put these antennas around all work areas in the lab. What that basically means is a stereo zoom microscope or a sperm preparation area. And these are places where we physically move the samples from one dish or tube to another. All of those places are covered with an, um, an RFID antenna. That means basically that the embryologist, the andrologist are doing the same work in the same place. It's just surrounded by this, this field. Um, what we would do then is when we have a, a Petri dish, we put a tag, a little microchip on it. And then when we bring it close to, the, as soon as we put it close to the microscope, the system is all going to automatically pick up uh, what that is. If it hasn't been seen by the system before, if it's a new dish, a clean, empty dish that we're about to use, then you're going to get a question mark. If, however, you bring a dish or a tube close to the reader and it has been used before, it already has some identification on it, then again, it's going to automatically uh, pull up the details of that patient and any recent history. So what the embryologist needs to do then um, is to put a microchip or a tag onto each bit of plasticware that they're going to use. Um, at the moment, at the, the very time that you bring that dish into that work area then, the system is going to allocate that new dish or tube to the one that's existing in the work area. That's how it passes the identification from one to another. And it will do this no matter what your protocol is. Um, I said uh, earlier on that it's important that a system shapes itself around to how you are going to work. Well, each system here is going to be bespokely programmed to exactly how you want to be working so that step by step, each name that you normally use for a step, each name that you normally use for a dish is exactly how you want it to be. In this way, then, it's going to follow the samples. From the moment we pick up the gametes, it has a microchip on both of the pots, all the way through 
to the embryo culture, to biopsy if you do biopsy, all the way through to freeze and through to transfer. So I think it's important to say that this system shouldn't really be turned off. It's on 24 seven. Um, it's also really important to understand that this is automatic witnessing. And this is the main difference really between this and anything else, single human witnessing, double human witnessing, barcode witnessing. This is really important because the embryologist, you're, you're doing the same work in the same area and you don't have to remember to ask for a check, whether it's calling someone else over to come and check what you're doing or whether it's holding it up to uh, a reader so that the reader can check. You don't have to do that. You carry on doing your work. The system is <laughs> going to check and monitor what you're doing. It will also provide full proof, full and evidence, the chain of, um, of, of traceability through all, each procedure, for every procedure for each patient and for each member of staff as well. It will also save time, that's time out of the incubator, of up to 50% for an ICSI cycle. That was a paper that came out a few years ago from um, a hospital in Liverpool. And that could actually, that time is gonna be important as well. The, um, the time that we save means we're going to hopefully speed up our work. And it's going to reduce the need for human double witnessing, which is obviously going to be very important if we're trying to maintain social distancing in the lab as much as possible. So just to summarize the actual use of the system in the lab, you, you put a microchip, a tag, on each dish or tube you're going to use. And you normally do this the night before when you prep the dishes. At the moment that you actually bring that dish onto the Starry Zoom, just before you're about to transfer the samples, you press the screen. And that, that pressing of the screen transfers the identity and, and moves that um, patient onto the next step. Essentially, it's the same procedures in the same work area. Okay, so I think hopefully you've got an idea of why we've developed this system in the way we have and, and roughly how it works. So now specifically looking at um, staff, <laughs> patient and staff safety during COVID era. So these are the things that I think we want to be kind of looking at. I, I know you've had your previous talk talked in much greater detail about this, but these are the things that I'm going to be focusing on. So. Um, the BFS, the British Fertility Society, and the ARCS, or ARCS, or what was ACE, the Assisted Clinical Embryologist, in the UK, a few weeks ago, they published their guidelines for um, advice for how to prepare for, for starting up again post-COVID closures. And one of the things that they talked about um, as regards equipment in the lab is they said where possible centers should cons consider using equipment that may allow for greater physical distancing, for example, electronic witnessing systems in the lab. And here are the reasons that they, uh, they, they said this. First of all, in terms of maintaining social distancing in the lab, so electronic witnessing reduces the need for human double witnessing. Um, there are still uh, a few steps where it is, uh, it is um, recommended or it is by law, depending on the country, where you really you still need to have two people cross-checking, particularly at the entry points into, an, into any system when we first have that uh, identification on the patient. Now, if we put our tablet interfaces, so that's a tablet PC, if we stick that on the, on, the, on the front of the workstation then, then a, a witnessing ID could be done actually at a quite a good distance. In terms of splitting staff into separate teams so you can do different shifts or so that if there was a, an infection, you're not gonna be um, compromising all of your staff at the same time. Well, reducing the, the need for human double witnessing means that you can have fewer staff per shift. 
Minimizing touching of surfaces. Okay, so the, with the electronic witnessing system, we have this little key fob. It's only about that big, and you often have it on wearing uh, on an elastic neck chain or something, or something attached to you. So actually, you can bring this forward where instead of touching to uh, to log in and touching to sign effectively that you've written something, you can just take your key fob and you can swipe next to the reader. And then you can log in without actually having touch, to touch surfaces. Um, people are suggesting that wearing PPE would, could reduce the communication between the staff. Um, and if you have an electronic witnessing system, then it's, it's a live update of everything that's happen, happening in the lab. And this can be up on a, on a big monitor on the wall in the in the lab or it could be on the office computers as well so that you can everybody can see automatically what things are happening what needs to be done next and we can allocate the next task to the right person for the next task uh, very easily and then lastly to help reduce interaction with patients we have um, an id card which, is, uh, which we give to the patients, we allocate to the patient, and it has the electronic data of that patient uh, with it. When that patient then comes in for egg collection or transfer, in, they can just, they could, you can check it at a distance, again, you can check it at a distance, but also they would then put that into the, the card reader. So the image that you can see on the screen is a theatre, remember a transfer theatre. So as she puts her card into the theatre, then her name will appear on the screen above it, the name, the reference number, date of birth, whatever it needs to be checked. So again, you can do um, a, a, an identification check of the patient without any proximity. Yeah, much better. So kind of just to talk a little bit about the UK figures again and how this COVID has changed. In February, roughly about 75% of all cycles in the UK were covered by the electronic witnessing. Now, over, since the last few, last few months, we have been contacted by many of the other clinics, the, the uh, older, the NHS, the ones with lower budgets perhaps, those clinics that haven't taken the leap into electronic witnessing like the rest, most of the rest of the country have. And now we expect that by, by July, we hope that by July, We'll have 85 to 90 percent of all the cycles covered. So let's just go back to uh, what I was aiming for at the beginning. Um, I want to now kind of talk to you about the other benefits that it could bring to the lab. So I said that it gives you the proof that of everything that's happened, <coughs> excuse me, every, everything that's happened in the lab and it gives you proof that um, all the SOPs were followed correctly. It will also not allow you to proceed to the next step for a patient unless you've got the correct things according to your protocols. If anything changes, if anything that is not prescribed by your SOPs occurs, then the system will record it as an unexpected event. It will either not allow you to proceed or it will record it as an unexpected event. And then the outcome of all of this is going to be a data set, which you could then just keep on file or you could print out. And that is your reliable evidence that everything was done correctly. So when you're actually working, if something happens that the system is not expecting, and particularly, sorry, specifically here, I'm talking about two samples from different patients coming to the same work area at the same time. As soon as you put that second sample close to the microscope, the system's going to detect it instantly and alert you. And the important thing here is going to warn you before anything happens, before there is the chance to, to make a, to, to have a failure, to make an error, to make a mistake. So that gives the embryologist the warning then, they correct whatever the error was, you record into the system what caused that error, what was the main kind of problem, 
and you carry on then to the next to, to the correct procedure. And that's happening at every work area all over the lab all the time. So that's actually quite a lot of data that's being collected. And it's all being collected automatically. Remember, you don't have to remember to ask for a check. You just do your normal stuff and, and it's just going to be monitoring and checking it. So as well as that um, chain of custody for the sample, the full kind of evidence of that, we also get some interesting data that we can pull out of it. So for example, how long those embryos were in the work area in total or for each procedure. We can see how long the egg collections took, uh, for example, how the different microscopes or work areas in the lab are used and how often, for example. We can also get a full list of all the consumables that were used for each patient. In the event of a recall from one of the media companies, we're going to immediately, as a press of a button, have a list of what patients could have been affected by that. A few more examples, specific examples. We can check that the denudation procedure, the vitrification procedure, was done within the time that we expect according to our um, SOPs. We can check that ICSI was done within the expected window post HCG. And it's also going to pull out some trends for us, which may point towards extra staff training or maybe something, maybe we do need to change the protocols. An example here would be if, um, if one particular member of staff, for example, embryologist Sally, keeps making the same mistake, then we need to focus on more training for her. And this will be evident here. The system will tell you what are the weak areas in your protocols or in your team so that you can address it and improve. So ultimately, all of this data that it's collecting and the analysis that the system can do is going to improve the quality of the, of the um, service that you provide to your patients. Um, let's check, I'm doing for time, okay, a little bit longer. Right, so just talking a little bit about um, furthering on from the system. Um, and specifically now, I just I don't, know, I don't know if Bryjack said before, but I've been with RI for over 20 years now, 21 years this year. So um, my knowledge of the RI witness system is, I hope, respectable. And my knowledge of other ele electronic witnessing systems is not so much. So specifically for these next few slides, I'm talking about the RI witness system, whereas before I wanted to kind of be more general and talk about all electronic systems. So when, when you're doing cryo then, the RI witness system puts the electronic ID, the RFID, from the tag on the cryo dish through to the cryo store into liquid nitrogen, and it stays in there. Uh, of course, um, until time of thawing comes. When you when you bring it out, you bring the straw out, you have your thaw dish ready, and then you scan the two at the same time, and that transfers the identity from the straw to the thaw dish electronically. Now, in terms of PGT here, what we can do is we can um, we can uh, identify the straws with the embryo number individually. So um, for example, I'm going to be doing biopsy on embryo three, five, and seven. So I print out my, um, my cryo labels for embryo number three, embryo number five, number seven, and the system, the witnessing system, the identification system knows that they are number three, five, and seven. So here we go, we're gonna freeze number three. Um, I've got my cryo dish with the embryo inside it and I bring my straw, which I've labeled embryo number three. When I've pressed my button to, to make the confirmation, it then transfers the identity for that patient and for the embryo onto the straw. Inside the database then, when you get the results back from the genetics lab, you can actually tell the system which ones, with the results that you've got, which ones are gonna be suitable for transfer or not. So I can say here that, uh, embryo number one 
not suitable for transfer, embryo number three is okay for transfer. Now that one means that, that what that means is that if I bring out a straw then for thawing and ultimately transfer that has not been approved for a transfer, then you're going to get an alert on the system where you bring a, a, um, one that has been approved for transfer, you bring your next dish, your thaw, your thaw dish or your culture dish, then it's okay, you can go ahead and you can do it. And the idea here is to try and avoid any mistakes, um, one of which uh, happened in the UK a few years ago, where there was a mix up between the genetics lab, the test results and the embryologist and, and, and the embryology lab. So I actually transferred um, an affected embryo. So just to kind of finish off then, just remember that the system, yes, it will help with social distancing in the lab. It will help with, um, with other aspects of, of post-COVID-19 operation, but it also covers the entire procedure from start to finish. It's in use all over, all over the world. We have lots of, lots of clinics using millions of embryos have been tracked through the system in terms of the safety efficacy of the system. And this is used from small clinics. I've got a clinic in Spain who only do 50 cycles per year. Nice, easy life they have, I am sure. But 50 cycles per year, and they, they use the system because they're, they're one person in the lab most of the time. So they like to have the system in place. And then we've got other clinics using, you know, doing 10,000 cycles per year. And again, it's really important for them. Uh, just, you know, their workflow, their throughput is so fast and rapid that this really assures them that they're not doing any they're not doing any identification errors. So then I shall practice my Turkish on you. I shall say Tishukadrim and I shall say Guvendekal Vistalik. And I hope that's correct. I haven't checked it. That's correct, Sally. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much. It's, it's a fantastic presentation. Thanks okay. a lot, Sally. What about the technical point? Is it okay? We are now continuing on. We still have five minutes for the questions, maybe. Okay. We have uh, a question from the same uh, person. Sally, uh, she has two questions. One is, uh, she is asking how many years the data will be kept. Uh, and for looking backwards, uh, how many years should have passed uh, that we can easily reach the data? Is there any limit for that? No. The data that's collected on the system is, is your data. You keep it on your server and you archive your database as you wish. Um, I would say that if you're not taking images and storing images in the system, then the database grows at about 100 megabytes per year on an average sort of 2000 cycle mm -hmm. clinic. So 100 megabytes per year of data is not a huge amount, which means um, you can, on, on modern computers, it will amply cover, it will amply keep your database there. Uh, so uh, the same uh, person asked you that, uh, let's uh, think about an ex experiment that we are doing we are using different culture media. Uh, can we have the same uh, confident tracking of both uh, uh, culture media uh, with the with this uh, device? Yeah. So what I would do then, what I have done, is um, I do different pathways. So when we program the system to how you want it to work, we would make one kind of workflow pathway for, for example, single step media. And then we would do a separate pathway for um, for um, the other one. The other one. <laughs> the sequential. When, when you change it for sequential media, okay. Well, so sequential. then we have two different pathways, and the patients would actually be kept separate. You, you'd be able to see actually which patients were kind of following which pathway as well. So for this sibling, uh, all sides or embryos, we can also do that uh, for the same patient. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you could do because you just split them into separate dishes. So it would. But the dishes uh, actually belong to the same person. It, yes, but the dishes are numbered individually. Each dig, each dish, each dish, or rather each tag has a unique identifier. 
So yes, I could have two egg collection dishes for Sally, but this one would be egg collection dish number one and egg collection dish number two, and they could follow different patterns. Okay, I, I have to explain it in Turkish the, uh, because uh, uh, şimdi uh, değerli katılımcılar, uh, bir katılımcımız şöyle sordu uh, Sally Lloyd'a, dedi ki ne kadar saklanabiliyor e, veriler? Bu size kalmış. Sizin veri tabanınızda çok da yüksek olmayan bir alan kapsıyor bu ve istediğiniz sürede saklayabilirsiniz. İkinci cevap da eğer bir hastada çalışma yapıyorsanız ve dişlerin iki ayrılıysanız sonuçta o hasta için tek edildiklerinden e, aynı güvenlikli bir şekilde e, takibini yapabilirsiniz ve hangi dişe hangi tagi koyduysanız ona göre de takip edebilirsiniz. Doğru anladım değil mi Başak? Yani sen de Evet hocam. Şekilde... Doğru. Doğru evet. Evet. Yani anladım. Ee, benim gördüğüm kadarıyla başka soru yok Başak. Senin iletmek hocam, istediğin şey var mı? Ha. E, gelmiş sorular bu arada evet, görüyorum. Evet. Bir, bir iki sorumuz daha var. Ha, ke, ke, Emer Kerem Dilican sormuş. Evet, ne sormuş? Sen cevap istersen sor. Tamam hocam. Uh, so there are two more questions, Sally. Uh, oh. One is, do you think a specific RFID code for each medical staff, each embryologist could also help to match procedure? Embryologist patient cell uh, so that to define the requirements for education, training and some other issues. So the question, I'm not sure I understand the second yeah. half of the question, but certainly the, the little key fob, I've got one here. The little key fob thing that I yep. showed you, this is an yep. RFID tag inside it. So this would be mine and everything I do on every workstation in the lab, I put this in first to log in. So I swipe it near to a reader and I've logged in. Now I'm operating it and now my work is um, is, is, is being monitored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the second part, I'm also reading it. Embryologist patient uh, cell so that to define the requirements for education, training, and some other issues. I mean, maybe he may wanted to say, you know, you also addressed this uh, issue during your lecture that when, you know, there are embryologists who have the repetitive mistakes being made, and these are all noted to the system. So yeah. that means that that specific embryologist would need a more training uh, when yeah. compared with the other staff working in the laboratory. Maybe yeah, this was um, what he wanted to address. Yeah, and also the system is going to record, it, it has data on what steps each person's done. So, for example, if I have three biopsy practitioners who are trained in biopsy, and I actually look at the data over the last six months, and I see that actually one of them has, has only done biopsy once. And maybe it's just coincidence that they're not on duty when the biopsies are there. Or maybe she's not confident or something and needs a little bit more training. There's something going on because it should be split fairly equally across all cap all skilled practitioners. And the system, the system will track and show you if there's any any issues to be highlighted there. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, one more question that uh, what was can the system also be synchronized with the incubator data? And what are the safety measures for RFID? Okay, um, two questions. First one's easy to answer. Um, no, not at the moment. But um, if you, at Eshri, we are launching something new, which is, it's going to be called RIQC. And that is going to be linking up everything in the lab so that we've got one kind of, platform to have a look at everything. I haven't really even seen it myself yet, but if you're attending Esh attending Eshri in a virtual manner, then come and have a look and, and they can explain how that's going to work very soon. And safety, in terms of safety, RFID safety. Um, before we launched this, so back in 2003, we got an independent test center to, to devise a test where we, a really robust experiment so that we could be sure that what we're doing here is not going to affect embryos. So what they did is they they took one of the readers, they put 10 times as much source power than what we use. We normally use um, one watt for the whole plate. 
they ramped it up to 10 watts and they put it inside the incubator and then they put mouse embryos on top and they cultured the mouse embryos right on top of that very high level, high powered plate for the entire length of time. Now, of course, the embryos aren't normally on that reader that much. In fact, they worked out that being cultured in the incubator on the reader directly was approximately 70 times more time, exposure time, let's say. So in total, with 70 times more time and 10 times as much power, our test was 700 times more exposure than what we would normally use. With that, there was no, um, there was no change in the development to blastocyst rate. There was no change in the live birth rate of the pups. And there was no change in the fertility of the female pups in the next generation as well. So that was, that was what we did before we came to market. Then since then, of course, we've been using this for 13 years and we've got, well, it's probably closer to 300 clinics now who are using the system. And uh, I mean, of course, if there was any question of safety, then they'd have stopped immediately. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll jump back to uh, uh, I think there is only one last question that we can ask you, Sally, that one of our viewers uh, asked that, can these data, uh, be seen uh, from the different countries of the same group may have uh, different uh, labs in different countries uh, in uh, different internet areas. It's an interesting question. Can we yeah, see? Yeah, sure. So, so the way it works, it's just um, it's just a relatively simple database. Um, so if you wherever you store that database, whether it's on a, com a physical computer in your clinic, or whether it's in a data center somewhere far further away. Um, as long as you've got access to that database, probably in this case via VPN, then then yes, you could access that data. Okay. Thank you very much, Sally. It's, okay. it's a wonderful presentation. Welcome. Very welcome. And I Pleasure. hope that uh, the uh, viewers like it uh, and will uh, share their knowledge with the colleagues everywhere in the country. And I hope that in soon uh, we'll also have more uh, systems like that in our country. Uh, Başak, senin cevaplarla ilgili paylaşmak istediğim bir şey var mı uh, seyircilerle? Uh, hocam şimdi zannediyorum doğru anladıysam bir tek Kerem'inki ile ilgili bir hani yorum yapayım. Biz de laboratuvarda bizzat kullanıcısı olduğumuz için bu sistemi. Zaten hani bu sistemi kullanan her kişi de biraz önce Seli de açıkladı. Hepimizin ayrı bir yine RFID taglerinin olduğu bir anahtarımız var. Yani bu anahtarla sisteme tanıtıyoruz ve her işlemi kim yapıyorsa her yapan kişi bunu tanıtarak sistemde Tabii işlemi yapıyor. Bunu da yapıyor. paylaşmamak gerekiyor aslında yani. Aynen öyle. Tabii başkasına vermemeniz gerekiyor dolayısıyla. Dolayısıyla zaman içerisinde siz o akümüle edilen datadan hani sistemde kimin hangi aşamada işte daha zayıf noktaları var, hangi aşamada karışıklık yapmaya daha meyilli gibi şeyleri görebiliyorsunuz. Yani hangi embriyolog daha yani dikkatli kaç, hangi embriyolog? Kaç dakika harcamış, kaç aynen dakika öyle. kaldırmış, Tabii. yazı Doğru. ne kadar zamanda yapmış filan. Evet aynen öyle. İşte hangisi daha e, karışıklık işte oluşturmaya daha meyilli gibi riskli sorulara da hani cevap arıyorsunuz bu sistemde. Bir de kaç, kaç defa alarm verdirmiş yani yanlış aynen, iş yapmış. Aynen. Tabii her alarm mutlaka orada bir mismatch yani bir hastayı karıştırdığı anlamına gelmiyor. Çünkü Tabii. gerçekten... Ee, hani o alarm çok distrakte edici bir alarm. Yani onu ignore edebilmeniz mümkün değil. Yani o aşamada stopluyorsunuz zaten. İşleme devam edemiyorsunuz. Çünkü sistem kitleniyor onu düzeltmeden gibi. Hani son derece pratik bilmiyorum. Hani biz dediğim gibi 5 yıldır kullanıyoruz ve Bu, şu anda laboratuvarda evet, onsuz bir öyle, hayat düşünemiyoruz. Evet. Ee, çok, çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, şimdi arkadaşlar bundan sonra gene harika bir konu var. Çok da güncel bir konu. Ee, birçok yeni add zone diye geçen e, ek tedavilerle ilgili ve e, eskiden beri e, süre gelen yeniden gündeme gelen bazı tedavilerle ilgili bunlarla ilgili e, bir sonraki e, konuşmada hem klinisyenleri hem embriyologları bil, e, ilgilendiren birçok e, bilgiye yer vereceğiz. E, bir kahve molası veriyoruz ardından e, konuşmaya geçiyoruz sonra da yine bir kahve molasının ardından da Güzel bir panel olacak. Uh, thank you again, Sally, very much. Uh, Thanks, and hope Sally. to see you again 
in Turkey okay. with uh, physical uh, presence. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.